Maths Aspirants Group's organizes several online problem solving sessions to help the students who prepare for competitive examinations like NET, JRF, GATE, Extra. In that series of lectures, uh, today we have Mr. Srijit Siju is with us. Mr. Srijit is now pursuing PhD at IIT Palakkad and his research area is functional analysis. Uh, Srijit completed his MSc from CMS College, Kottayam, Kerala. I'm very happy to introduce Srijit to uh, our group of students. Let us hope that today's session will be really useful for your net examination as well as gate examination. Even though there is a uh, little portion of, from functional analysis is there in the syllabus, but uh, you know, uh, I think uh, four or five questions may be there from functional analysis area for gate as well as net examination. So I hope that today's sessions will be really helpful for you to grasp the ideas uh, related with functional analysis and and help help you to solve the problems from this area. I welcome everyone to this event. Welcome, Srijit. First uh, few minutes, I will quickly recall uh, some of the basic definition and results uh, that we have already studied in functional analysis. And we'll be using uh, those results and definitions while solving this, uh, solving problems that I have prepared. So I hope I can start. Uh, quickly recall those definitions and i'll go uh, i won't go to much details but i'll give the necessary definitions that will be needed to understand the question and uh, to need to how to solve the those questions so uh, we know that uh, when we look at the structure of uh, the vector space r power n uh, so you consider the vector space r power n then it, it has this linear structure of addition. R power n has addition in it. And there is a scalar multiplication. In it. And if you go back sometime in time, then and when you reach your uh, higher, higher secondary class, you will see that this r power n was not just a vector space that time. It's not just a vector space because you were able to do some calculus. Uh, you already did some calculus on r power n. So what you have done that time was you had this vector so you mainly did in r power 3 so there uh, you worked in a concrete example like r power 3 what you did is you had this vector x1 i plus x2 j plus x3 k this is how you represented a vector in r power 3 then if you have another vector y1 i y2 j plus y3k again in r power 3 you were able to perform something called dot product that is you if i call this vector x and if you, if i call this vector y then you were able to do something called uh, the dot product so you did something called dot product uh, what you did is you took uh, two vectors x and y then you computed this quantity uh, x2 y2 plus x3 y3 then this is a number which is going to be in r a real number <clears throat> and from this you can also calculate what is called a dot product with a vector itself and this will give you uh, sorry x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square and you call this something as no x square and what what does this say this is nothing but distance between uh, 
the zero vector to the vector x so if I, if i look at this r power 2 you have a vector x here with the components x1 x2 mm, what is the what is this distance we are looking at this distance okay if i call this d then d is nothing but root of x1 square plus x2 square and this will work in r power 3 also so if this was another vector x1 x2 x3 so this will be x3 square and this is nothing but uh, this we denote by norm that is the distance between the origin the zero vector to the vector x and this was nothing but uh, the dot product of x with itself so now we are in a position where uh, we have a distance now we have a distance between elements in a vector space so actually i gave you an example how to calculate a distance between zero to a vector x now you can compute uh, distance between two vectors so what will be distance between two vectors if you have x and y then distance between x to y will be norm of x minus y and it's if you are in r power 3 this will be uh, inner product sorry for that x minus y dot product x minus y i am speaking only on r3 now I am speaking about the uh, vector space r power 3 or r power n. So now you have distance between two vectors x and y. <clears throat> and you can check that this distance so different that is if I different distance between x and y to be uh, norm of x minus y and which is nothing but root of uh, dot product x minus y x minus y if i define this way this distance this is actually a definition of distance this distance satisfies satisfies all the properties of a metric all the properties of a metric all right <clears throat> and once you have a metric then on r power n and once you have a metric on r power n then you get a topology on r power n and that means you can do analysis on the vector space r power n and by the word analysis what I mean is you can take limits that's it now you can speak about sequences its convergence and all such things can be done in vector space initially we didn't have this uh, uh, this uh, what it is called this feature for a vector space but once you have a metric on the vector space then you can do analysis on that vector space now when you look at these properties of this so-called no so again you look at the vector space r power n with this no that i got from uh, dot product and when you look at this no what and all properties this no satisfy one property is that norm of x uh, is always greater than or equal to zero you can directly see this from the definition of no because it will look like something x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square and you are taking the positive square root and the second property or the property which comes along with this is that if norm x equal to zero then you can conclude that x is equal to zero and this is 
true in the reverse direction also so norm x is equal to 0 if and only if x equal to 0 and another property is that alpha times x norm of alpha times x is nothing but modulus of alpha times norm x where alpha is coming from the scalar field f and in our case it was real line r okay and one important property is that norm of x plus y is less than or equal to norm x plus norm y. Okay. This is called triangle inequality. <clears throat> so here this function norm, this is actually a function from where to where this is function from uh, r power 3 or r power n to r okay so in r power n what you have is in r power n you we can have in r power n there exists a function denoted by norm which satisfies all these properties mentioned above one two three these three properties okay so in r power n you have a function and we denote that by this expression norm and which satisfies all these properties and naturally this norm on r power n comes from the dot product x dot y okay now we are trying to generalize these results to arbitrary vector spaces that and we are asking the question does there are other vector spaces which admit similar or which admits a norm on it so this is the question that we asked now so a norm by a norm we mean a function from the vector space and the underlying vector space to the scalar field uh, such that um, it satisfies all these properties so when we say no we should understand that it, it's not just a function but it should sa also satisfy all the properties mentioned here okay and we define what what is called a known space abstractly so i'll give you the definition of known space known space mm. so we have the underlying set is a vector space x is a vector space <coughs> x is so we saw an example of r power n now we are uh, define what is called a known space abstractly so here x is yes upar kijiye sir thoda bas bas thoda sa last ki portion likh lijiye other vector space ha okay sir Mm -hmm. so x is a vector space uh, then a norm on x denoted norm on x is a function uh, this is the notation usual notation for norm x to r such that one, one norm of x is greater than or equal to zero norm x equal to zero if and only if x equal to zero second norm of alpha times x equal to mod alpha times norm x and third norm of x plus y is less than or equal to norm x plus norm y so if all these properties are satisfied then we say that this function is a norm on the vector space x and 
uh, what is a norm space? A norm space is a vector space together with a norm on it. So if you have a vector space and if there exists a norm on that vector space, then we say that uh, the old structure. So if I call the vector space X and if and if there is a norm on X, this old structure is called a norm space. <laughs> So this is the basic definition of norm space, and uh, you have the example. Hello. Yes. Please repeat. Norm space space is a vector space. Then what should be written? Uh, basically, it is a vector space together with a norm on it, together with a function of this kind. The underlying set is a vector space, and if there exists a function. Uh, which I denoted by this expression such that that function satisfies the properties listed here. That is the properties 1, 2, 3. If that satisfies, then the vector space together with that norm, we call it a norm space. This whole structure. So, uh, usually you have seen how a topology is different. Topology, the underlying set is a uh, uh, the underlying object is a set X together with a collection to of subset. So this structure is called a topological space, right? Similarly, we have a vector space X, we have a norm, and this structure is called norm space. You have you, you can see similar uh, objects, similar other objects in math. Uh, if you have an underlying set X, you have a sigma algebra and a measure you you call this a measurable space so if we have an additional structure on the underlying set or vector space then we uh, then we have something new new object in new object to study here uh, we have we had vector space and we had linear algebra and when we add norm to the vector space we have uh, norm space and we have functional analysis So the first example will be r power 3 that you did in your class 12 and you can also have r power n, you can have c power n and when I say, the, when I list this vector space, you should be able to come up with the norm. So here the norm is the norm you obtain from inner product that is norm of x will be uh, root of x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square. Hello sir. Hello yes. sir. Yes. Sir, can you, can you retain symbol measurable space? So that's not our topic of interest. So I just said it. Uh, maybe you may not have studied what is called a measurable space. Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. Those who have already seen that example may understand. So in C power N, you can similarly define. This will be root of mod x1 square plus etc. mod x1 square. And now I'll like to give you some non-trivial examples. This is this all uh, you can easily come up with. Now I'll give you an example in R power n, which is not the use uh, a norm which is not uh, it cannot be obtained from the inner product, the dot product. So you take R power n, you take a vector x in R power n and x will be of the form x1, x2, etc, xn. So x will look something like this. Now you define norm x to be modulus of x1 plus etc plus modulus of xn. And you can check and this is called the one norm. Okay, you can check. The one norm defines a norm on r power n which is different from uh, 
the usual norm that can be obtained from from the dot product and when i say different uh, you don't worry much about it you learn when two norms are different uh, you might have already seen that when we say two norms are different anyway this is another norm on r power n similarly you can define something called the maximum norm or the supremum norm this is nothing but maximum of mod x1 comma mod x2 comma etc mod x so these are all known on r power n and these norms are not obtained from a dot product okay now let's now so far we were working with finite dimensional vector spaces now i would like to give an example of an infinite dimensional vector space with a norm on it uh, there are many examples but um, i'll give you the simplest example of infinite dimensional norm space so um, let me tell you what is the dimension what we mean by dimension so dimension uh, of a norm space so by definition a norm space is a tuple x together with a norm on it and here x is a vector space so it has dimension vector space has dimension that you already know and we define dimension of the norm space x norm to be to be the vector space dimension of x so uh, dimension of a norm space is nothing but the vector space name dimension of the underlying space x so now i'll give you an example you look at uh, the space which i denoted by l infinity this is all vectors a and they are nothing but sequences n equal to 1 to infinity such that uh, supremum n belongs to n mod a n is finite so in other words l infinity contains or l infinity is the vector space of all vector space of all bounded sequences in f by f i mean scalar field either r or c so always f will be either r or c and how will you define a norm now we have a vector space you can simply check that some uh, of about sum of two bounded sequences are again bounded and if you multiply it with a scalar it is again going to be bounded so we have a vector space structure on l infinity now how do we define a norm on l infinity and we can take intuition from this definition of norm and we define norm of a bar to be so here a bar will be a sequence a this is nothing but supremum n n n mod a n and you can check this is indeed a norm check is a norm on l infinity so this l infinity is called the space of all bounded sequences now uh, another non trivial example uh, will be of this you consider l2 which is set of all a bar again they are sequences such that here we demand this summation a n square 
to be finite mm. so this is again a space of sequences you can simply check this is a vector space and how to define a norm on l2 so you define norm of an element to be nothing but summation is equal to 1 to infinity mod a n squared and again you can check it's a norm on l2 <coughs> Now, I, uh, if you're okay with this much material, then I'll I have to define one more thing. Uh, that is, that is the functions between uh, two norm spaces. Mm -hmm. So let me recall that too. So whenever you study some mathematical object, like group or uh, topological space or metric space. Uh, you will always consider the map between those spaces. And when you consider map between, so if you have two mathematical structures, X and Y, say, I'm not saying that X and Y are known spaces. So this is one kind of mathematical structure. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is the same kind. I mean, this can be group, this can be vector space, this can be known space, anything. And you always consider something called maps functions from x to y. And if your underlying space is a, uh, is a group, uh, we usually consider the map which are uh, kind of preserve the structure on x. That is, our interest is on those maps which can tell something about the space x or the mathematical object x uh, and another way to see this is that if you have uh, uh, a group say g and it's very abstract in definition and once you can have a map f from g to some h another group and if you know the group H very well, like if it is a permutation group or something. Permutation group. H is a permutation group and G is different. Uh, it's a very abstract group group that its definition is very abstract. And if you have a map F from G to H such that F preserves the operation of G, then and if f is 1, 1, and f is 1, 2, then what you actually have? Then your abstract group G is nothing but H. It's just a matter of uh, renaming the elements. So once you have such map F with these properties, to study G, you only need to study H. So it is just a renaming, H is just a renaming of this abstract group G. And if this if this group H is very concrete like permutation group, you can simply understand G by just looking at H. So when you, when you consider map between same kind of object, you, can, you mostly consider map which can tell something about the domain or the group from or the object from the map is different so in our case we have we have our underlying space x to be uh, a norm space so we want to study this norm space by mapping this x to other non normed spaces so what kind of map we should be looking at that is the question so this x has algebraic structure and x has topological structure and when i say topological structure i mean the topology induced from from the norm or uh, I, I'll simply uh, write it has a metric structure. X has metric structure. 
so when we look at maps uh, to study x by embedding x, x into other uh, known spaces we will be mainly looking at those maps uh, t from a known space x to y which preserves these two structure of the known space x so we are mainly interested in those maps which preserve the algebraic structure that is it is linear that is if t is a map t of x plus y should be t of x plus t of y so this is such map is called linear and one more condition is there t of alpha x is nothing but alpha times tx so we are looking at linear maps and when we say that t preserves the metric structure uh, t of uh, norm of tx equal to norm of x so these two properties says that this map t preserves the algebraic structure and the metric structure this is the algebraic structure this is the metric structure and if in addition t is 1 1 and 1 2 we say t is an isometric isomorphism similar to the case with groups uh, here if there exists a map t from two known spaces uh, map from uh, if t is a map from the known space x to y and if t satisfies all these properties then we say that the x is same as y so it is uh, there is nothing much different from x to uh, x and y we are just uh, we are just have to rename uh, the elements of x so that we can get y and how is the renaming done if you have an element x in x then you just rename it into tx then you will end up in y you are getting y so in in uh, functional analysis the map we are interested in is nothing but uh, linear maps linear maps that is those maps t from a known space x to another known space y such that uh, t x equal t of alpha x equal to alpha times t x and t of x plus y equal to t of x plus t of y. This is the map we are going to consider. Like we considered homomorphism in uh, group and in ring, we are going to consider. Uh, like we considered continuous map in uh, calculus, this is the map we are interested in functional analysis. Okay, and one more property is there uh, that I'm going to tell you now. If you have a map T from a known space X to Y, then you can look at this quantity supremum norm X equal to one, uh, or I'll write supremum X not equal to zero, X belongs to X, norm TX by norm X, where T, where T is from, x to y okay if this is turns out to be finite then we say that then we say that t is bounded this is not the usual definition of boundedness you are used to because uh, in real analysis or in some other subject when we say a function is bounded when it, this happens modulus of f of x is less than m for all x in the domain d this is the usual boundedness def definition but this is uh, not the boundedness definition here uh, when we deal with linear operators or linear maps uh, i usually interchange the terms linear operator linear map and linear function all are same okay these all are same in in functional analysis we usually say linear operator okay so if this quantity is finite then we say that the operator the operator t is bounded 
and it's a well known result in functional analysis using the linearity of t we can prove that t is bounded if and only if t is continuous as a function okay you must uh, you may recall this okay boundedness if and only if t is continuous continuous with respect to the metric topology on the space x okay so for an operator t to be continuous we only need t to be bounded in this way not the usual boundedness bounded in this way okay and one thing you can get for free is that if the dimension of x is finite if dimension of x is finite and if t is from x to y is linear uh, this is actually a theorem and if t is from x to y is linear then t is continuous you don't have to worry about the boundedness or the continuity so boundedness and continuity we can interchange when we are working in uh, normed spaces right so once you have a linear operator t from x to y and if dimension of x is finite then it is always going to be continuous this is a well known result in functional analysis so now you have uh, you have seen what is known space what is operator now the, this kind of operator that t from uh, a known space x to underlying scalar field f has a special name so t from x to y uh, x to uh, f such uh, such that t is linear then t is called a linear functional so it's just a linear operator from x to the scalar field f has a special name that's it it is called linear functional okay so that's it i mean that's enough uh, for our introduction now we can move to problems and when uh, definitions are needed there we will discuss that type so now uh, you are going to look at some problems uh, you have you have seen what is a known space and what is an operator and you can also uh, you may also need this so you consider this collection which is denoted by b of x y and this is nothing but set of all bounded linear uh, operator operators from x to y so what is actually b of x y this is nothing but you said t from x to y comma uh, t is linear comma this quantity supremum x not equal to zero x belongs to x norm t x by norm x is finite then you can make this collection into a normed space and how to do that anyway this is a vector space that you can check very easily now how do we define a norm on b of x y you define you take an operator t in b of x y and you know that t is linear and it is bounded you define norm t to be supremum x not equal to zero x in x norm tx by norm x so in this way you can make b of x y into a norm space this makes b of x y a norm space now what is remaining yeah I mean, the one more thing that the completeness part so you have this norm space x and you have uh, a norm on x now you can think about sequences xn 
in x and you can speak about the convergence of the sequence x in. and you can define what is called a cauchy sequence in x so the same way instead of modulus xn minus xm you put no so a something a sequence xn is called cauchy if this is less than epsilon for all n from i m greater than a fixed n and x is complete if uh, every cauchy sequence converges and in that case x is called a Banach space so a Banach space is nothing but complete normed space in a normed space in which every cauchy sequence converges is called a Banach space named after the mathematician Stephen Banach So a Banach space is a complete norm space. I think now we can uh, switch to problems. Mm, some question you may have already seen. Uh, so let's look at question number one. So you have uh, two normed spaces, x and y, and an operator t from x to y. Then the question is about uh, the continuity of the map t. So and this is asked in K 2007. Uh, so the question is when t is going to be continuous. Under what assumption we can have the continuity of t. So option A is uh, y is finite dimensional. So the range is finite dimensional. So can anyone answer this question? Will it be true that if t is from x to y such that dimension of y is finite, will t be continuous? Anyone? Those who have did their course in functional analysis? Okay. Uh, so this is not true. And even in the similar case, we can uh, we can construct an example where y y has dimension one, and there can be con uh, there can be linear discontinuous linear function uh, operators. So you take x to be infinite dimension dimension x to be infinite here in the first option assume, there, there isn't any assumption on dimension of x so you can the, the only assumption is that y is finite dimensional so you take dimension of x to be infinite and y to be the scalar field f and you take so since dimension of x is infinite you can have a basis an infinite base uh, can have an infinite uh, linearly independent set so this uh, infinite linearly independent set okay now you define a map t from x to f as t of e1 or t in general t of e n as n and t of x equal to zero if x not t in 
belongs to span of e1 etc en okay or you can define t of x to be anything need not be zero this is the simplest way you can define you just uh, this example says is that you, you you can always have an infinite linearly independent set there you define t of en to be en and you extend that basis to an all basis of x and you extend that linear function extend that operator t linearly now what this says is that um, this you can assume that this vector has no one or if this vector doesn't have no one you can always normalize this just like you can define it uh, you can uh, divide it by it's no then the norm of this vectors will be one so i am assuming that these are normalized vectors that is uh, norm of each vector in this linearly independent set is one so in this case what is norm of t what is norm of t by definition this is supremum x not equal to zero x belongs to x norm tx by norm x so here if you put x equal to en what you are getting is norm of en is one this is uh, then this symbol is okay then norm of t e n equal to n so as n tends to infinity or this is not bounded that implies this quantity is not bounded is not bounded right because if we put x equal to en then you are getting this supremum to be n and as you have there are infinitely many n and it is true for any n in the natural number n this quantity cannot be bounded so that implies t cannot be continuous okay mm. now the second option if x is finite dimension i think we have already discussed this that i have given as a theorem that if the uh, dimension of domain is finite then this is true and if x is finite dimensional then every linear operator is continuous if x is finite dimensional then every linear operator is continuous and i have already mentioned that continuity and boundedness are equivalent and it's bounded now t is one more and t is on two now the question is t from x to y is continuous if uh, the other options we have is that one is t is one one and the other is t is one two can you say will this be true will it be true if the map is one one can it be continuous sir ah yes hello hi sir if uh, if y is finite di dimensional then and uh, t is one one or two then x must be fi x must must be finite dimensional right yes then t will be continuous but here we don't have the assumption that y is finite dimensional that 
here the only mm. assumption is that t is 1 1 and the question is will t be uh, continuous okay okay that was in option 1 right ah the the finite dimension was in option 1. so we have said okay, okay. that uh, this uh, i i didn't see much similar example but this is not true i can give you one example maybe you can find other good examples the example that i that came to my mind first is this uh, you need a uh, unbounded operator which is 1 1 so i took the vector space x to be uh, set of all uh, polynomials x to be set of all polynomials with uh, p of 0 equal to 0 set of all polynomials p with p of 0 equal to 0 that is the constant m is not there now uh, how we define norm of a polynomial p to be uh, so so elements will be polynomials you have a polynomial p of t in x how do we define norm of p of t this is nothing but supremum okay set of all polynomials uh, with the p of on p on some closed interval 0 1 that is also needed so supremum t belongs to 0 1 uh modulus of p of t this is how i uh, uh define a norm on this set x so this you take x to be set of all polynomials and you consider that as functions from 0 1 to r and you define norm on x to be uh, norm of a polynomial p is nothing but the supremum t in 0 1 modulus of p of t So this is going to be a norm. Now you need to construct an operator t from x to x, which is one one, which is one one, and uh, t is not continuous. To find an operator t not continuous, so and it is not bounded. so can anyone give an example of an unbounded operator i'll give you a hint that it is related to derivative so you just take p you have a polynomial uh, t from x to x t of a polynomial p i can write a n x power n plus etc a 1 x mm, now this is nothing but d by dx of a n x power n plus etc plus a 1 x so this will be uh, n a n x power uh, one second Okay, n x power n minus one, etc. Plus a one. So first, I'll show that this map is not one one. So I'll take uh, two elements in the image, and if they are equal, I'll show that the three images are equal. So assume that. n x power n so this image will again a polynomial so if you have a polynomial and if you apply the differentiation operator you are again getting a polynomial uh, so this is not from uh, x to x because there will be constant times so I, i'll take some space y anyway this will be the space will be of uh, consisting of all polynomials so and if you have Two polynomials. 
say a n x power n plus etc plus a not because in the range the constant time may not be zero so there will be an a not coming and if this is equal to some b n x power n plus etc plus b not then from the uh, this quantity you can say that one second uh, from this you can conclude that an equal to bn uh, an minus 1 equal to bn minus 1 so etc a not equal to b not so which says the pre images are same that is what is the pre image of these two and this will be uh, there i have to divide it by divide it with by some n minus 1 so the expression may look a bit ugly but i'll i'll go with the simple thing that if uh, say a x a n x power n equal to some b n x power n. this is enough i guess if you have the these coefficients are same that is if this these two polynomials are there in the image and if they are same then this will imply a n equal to b n and that will in turn says that uh, the pre images are same so you, you can easily verify but this expression will look a bit ugly so i am not going to write that so this operator t is clearly one one uh, t is one one now why this the point here I am trying to say is that T is not bounded. And why T is not bounded? Because if you take the polynomial x power n and if you apply T, you are getting T n times x power n minus 1. So here, what is norm of the polynomial x power n? So here I took T. So instead of T, I am writing it as x. So things will be easy so this is x so if you take the polynomial x power n the supremum x belongs to 0 1 uh, modulus of x power n and this will be 1 okay so this polynomial x power n has norm 1 and if you put that in this expression supremum norm tx by norm x so if our, uh, I'm again using many x's x here so i am i am taking v here an element from a from the norm space i will denote in this case i will denote it by v so supremum v not equal to zero v belongs to x and if you if you put v equal to x power n then you will get uh, this supremum will be greater than or equal to uh, Yes, we are taking supremum over all x or all v. So in particular, this will uh, in particular if v equal to x power n, this all supremum will be greater than norm of t of x power n divided by norm of x power n, and this is nothing but t of x power n is nothing but n n uh, x power n minus one divided by its norm is one, and if n greater than uh, or equal to two or one also uh, yeah we can also take yeah so this will be uh, a norm of this will be n so this x you can uh, see that this supremum is all the way this quantity supremum v not equal to zero v belongs to x norm tv divided by norm v is greater than n for all n because you can put x power n for any values of n so this is greater than n and which says t is not bounded that implies t is not continuous okay and this Proof of T is one that you can do with your own. That's it. So the third option is also not true. That what just being one one doesn't say uh, 
does not say that t is continuous now you need t is on to if t is on to then you all have already seen one example in this case if t is on to can t be continuous first example will work sorry ah uh, first example will work right because we were defining that to uh, the scalar field f and so the first example will work that the first example that we took t of en equal to n that will work okay so being on to does not say that t is continuous that's it now the second question now this is an interesting question so you consider the hilbert space i have in define what is a hilbert space uh, but you don't need that actually i'll i'll rephrase this question in the question paper it is given that hilbert space so i so we are not using any property of hilbert space here so i am writing rephrasing this as norm space so you consider the norm space l2 uh, that i have already defined which is consisting of all sequences xn with this sum being finite so here they are taking xn from uh, the reals so you don't if there is no difference if you take modulus or not if you are taking uh, xn from complex field then you have to put a modulus here so this is the space of all sequences where this sum is finite and now the question is you consider this set xn which is a uh, set of see set of all sequences xn such that modulus of xn is less than or equal to 1 by n for all n. that is if, if you take the nth coordinate then the modulus of that nth coordinate will be less than or equal to 1 by n and the question is about the interior this is the interior of e what is going to be the interior of e so this question simply try to know that uh, what you know about how a neighborhood of an element look like in l2 so if you have an idea of of neighborhood in uh, uh, l2 then you will be able to answer this question so let me make some space here the question is what will be interior of e so you consider the first option a interior of e is set of all x such that mod xn less than 1 by n for all n so can anyone answer this question so this doesn't need much uh, uh, what theory or anything you just need to know how a neighborhood look like in l2 So, can this set be the interior of uh, E? No, sir. Because uh, if I consider uh, 1 by N itself. Okay. Sorry, which sequence? The one, of, you, you said 1 by N. Yes, 1 by N. Okay, 1 by N is not <laughs> in E note. Okay. Uh, 1 by N is not in E0, but 1 by N should be because summation of 1 by N square. Mm -hmm is also uh, yeah it is finite it but belongs to l1 yeah it belongs to l2 uh, but what is the definition of an interior point but now we consider a sequence from one less than one by n that converts to one by n uh, actually this e naught is clearly a subset of uh, e 
and we are taking e to be the subset of l2 so this xn is actually coming from l2 and we are taking e e not subset of e and e not is so the question is not that uh, rigorous so there is i mean here when they say that a set of all x such that x and here this x should be from e uh, that also need okay okay yeah. so can anyone answer this so how a neighborhood of neighborhood in l2 will look like once i tell you this you may be able to answer this question so you take a point uh, x in l2 which is a sequence now uh, which is a sequence xn x equal to xn so you you are given an epsilon greater than 0 you are looking at an epsilon neighborhood of x so this will be set of all y such that norm of x minus y is less than epsilon correct right okay in and what is norm of x minus y in l2 what is the norm l2 the norm is summation modulus of x n minus y n square is less than epsilon that is set of all sequence y n in l2 such that so this is the this is an epsilon neighborhood of uh the sequence x n now can you say uh can you say something about e not so what are the uh, possibilities of yn it anyway it will depend on xn but if you choose xn which satisfies this property if you choose one particular xn which satisfies this property then what are the possibilities of yn that is the question first you 1 have by to, n square 1 by n cube uh, first you have to okay uh, you choose xn then you look at the possibilities of yn Uh, what did you say? One by n to the power p is something. Uh, is it y n or x n? X n. X n. Then if x n is one uh, one by n to the power p, then what are the possibilities of y n? In X n, you can even make it simple. You need an X n which satisfies this property. One by two n. Property. One by three n. Hmm. Then, then what happens? One by. You look at the uh, very simplest X n which satisfies this property, and what will be that? I am taking that. Zero XN sequence sums. Yes, exactly. I am taking uh, X n to be zero, and this condition is satisfied, right? now you tell me what are the possibilities of y n so if i put x n equal to 0 so this will be set of all y n in l2 such that summation mod y n square is less than epsilon right yes sir is this, the, is this right and what are those y n so if i take y n uh so epsilon assume that epsilon is given i mean we are looking we are trying to see whether this point uh we are trying to see whether this point xn is an interior point L right if this condition is true then xn equal to 0 0 0 should be an interior point right so we are trying to see whether uh, xn equal to uh, 0 0 is an interior point of e 
but uh, if x n is an interior point then there should exist a neighborhood around this uh, and all those points y n should be and in that case we need set of all y n belongs to l2 such that summation y n square less than epsilon should be a subset of e for some epsilon this is what we need right if x n is an interior point if x n is an interior point if x n is an interior point then there exists at least one neighborhood that is for some epsilon this this set should be contained in e so can you tell me why this set cannot be contained in e you take uh, a 1 by n which is less than epsilon you take an n such that 1 by n is strictly less than epsilon then you consider the sequence y n which is 0 0 0 0 and on the nth coordinate you put epsilon or epsilon root epsilon i mean this you take root epsilon then everything will be easy so this will be root epsilon the rest are zero so this is the nth ten we hand how did we get that n we take an n such that one by n is less than root epsilon and if you compute this y n then uh, y n square this will be uh, less than epsilon this, yeah this is epsilon uh, but we need this to be strictly less than epsilon right so we have to uh, do something so if you take this root epsilon by 2 or something root of epsilon by 2 okay uh, so this will be if you take 1 by n to be less than root epsilon by 2 and if you put this is root epsilon by 2 this will be epsilon by 2 uh, which is strictly less than epsilon right so this is fine and and what happened to y n here so if you look at the nth term of y n then n nth term of y n is greater than 1 by n right yes in the term in the term of y n in the term of y n is greater than 1 by n so that means y n cannot be in e by definition e was set of all xn such that n the term should be less than or equal to y uh, 1 by n but now we got a y n such that the n the term of that sequence is not in e so if zero is there in the interior point zero cannot be in the interior point because whatever be the neighborhood you take around zero you will always get a point y n in that neighborhood which is not in e that means zero cannot be there in the interior of e if zero cannot be in the interior of E, zero satisfies this property, right? So this cannot be true. And clearly this also cannot be true because of the same reason. And what about the third option? A set of all x such that x n strictly less than one by n for all but finally many n. That is only few times are less than one by n and the rest are zero again because of the same reason this is also not true because here also this the zero vector satisfies this property this is also not true so and 
the only option is that e naught is the integer of e is empty that there can can't be any uh, vector in the integer of e and that's it now now let's move to so i don't think i will get enough time to cover all these problems this question you might have already seen so i don't need to discuss this right you have seen this question if if you have to uh, set e1 and e2 then you know when this e1 and e2 are uh, closed open not closed right you might have already seen this many times so i am skipping that question and i'll and I'll go to Hilbert space, Hilbert space. This is a Hilbert space question. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to question number six. This, this question uh, needs some important theorems of functional analysis, which is called the uniform boundedness principle. So I'll tell you what it is Maybe this is just a question is a bit long. So you have two normed spaces X and Y. Uh, and if you have an operator Tn, sequence of operator Tn from uh, X to Y. This given, two statements are given. One is uh, the norm of Tnx is bounded for each X in X. So that means uh, if, you can, if you fix an X and if you consider the sequence Tnx, it is bounded. And the bound can be vary for uh, x as you vary x. And the second statement is that the norm of the operator itself is bounded. And there is a theorem which relates these two statements. And the theorem is the, uh, called uniform boundedness principle. Uh, now I'll state that theorem. Uh, and once you have that theorem, and it's very uh, what very fundamental theorem in functional analysis. So once you have that theorem, you can simply answer this question. The uniform boundedness theorem says is this: if T n is an operator uh, from x to y, where x is that is the only assumption, where x is a Banach space, that is x is complete, and if the sequence tnx is bounded for all x in x uh, then norm tn is bounded this is uniform uh, boundedness principle that if you have a sequence of operator tn and if this sequence tnx is bounded for each x in x and you may note that this bound may not be uniform for x that as you vary x the bound can also vary and and if your domain is a Banach space then this sequence tn is itself bounded that's what uniform boundedness theorem says Sorry. Sir, so option three. Yeah. Then, yeah. Now you can simply answer what will be uh, the answer. Yeah. Like you said, option C. If X is a Banach space, then P implies Q. So this is the exact statement of uh, uniform boundedness theorem. So once you prepare for this exam, you may. Uh, there are only few 
not few but main uh, really important theorems in functional analysis one is uniform boundedness principle and another is open mapping theorem uh, open mapping theorem so this is another important one and it, and the other one is ries representation theorem uh, ries representation and the next is closed graph theorem so there can be questions uh, from this important theorem and sometimes the question can be asked very directly and to get a counter example for all other facts you can refer to uh krasik irwin krasik irwin krasik introductory functional analysis introductory functional analysis this is a book uh, written by irwin krasik called introductory functional analysis and there you can see examples where why this assumption this banach space assumption is really needed in the statement of the theorem okay so this is just a straightforward question and i just wanted to let you know the importance of uniform boundedness principle so i just took this question uh now uh uh, this this question also looks interesting so you consider the real norm space x uh, with finitely many uh, non zero times okay so your vector space will be again of sequences but here only finitely many times of the sequences are non zero and the rest are zero so the see uh, those sequences which are eventually zero and the norm is supremum norm uh, you take the operator t from x to x uh uh defined by t of x1 x2 x uh, etc to be of this form that you are dividing each coordinate by if you are dividing nth coordinate by uh, n or multiplying it by 1 by n then which of the following is true that is the question so the first is t is bounded but t inverse is not bounded so can anyone answer this anyone mm. So the question is you have t from i denote by c not not to c not not where c not not is set of all xn such that xn is eventually zero and norm of x equal to supremum over n mod xn this is our space and t is uh, t of x1 x2 etc is nothing but x1 x2 by 2 x3 by 3 etc so the question is the first option is t is bounded t inverse is not bounded <coughs> so here if you calculate no t by definition it is supremum of x not equal to 0 x belongs to x norm t x by norm x so what do you get so you just compute what will be t x for an x so this will be norm of uh, x1 x2 by 2 plus etc etc the infinite norm so this will be maximum of uh, yeah, t is bounded the, yeah t is actually bounded modulus of x n by n maximum over n or supremum over n 
which is less than or equal to supremum or n mod xn right and which is nothing but norm x so what you got is that norm of tx is less than or equal to norm x so you divide by norm x on both side you get norm of tx by norm x is less than or equal to 1 right so if you take supremum it bound uh, stays so t is bounded now what can you say about what about t inverse not bounded yeah how t inverse will look like so again if you have a sequence x1 etc x2 x3 etc then the image will be x1 2x1 2x2 3x3 etc so can this be bounded no right so how do you prove that so you take the sequence 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 in nth component and you apply t inverse to this vector x what you are getting is 0 0 0 n in the in the component right and then what is norm of t inverse x it will be n so uh, and norm of x will be 1 so this quantity cannot be bounded so t inverse is not bounded Okay, and I think that will answer other options also. So this is true, this is false, t is bounded, uh, this is false, this is false. So from that, you were able to answer uh, everything. Um, now, there are some Hilbert space theory coming in. Before that, let me look at... Uh, there any question from okay now we can go to question number 12 uh, okay you consider uh, so this example might be new to you you consider uh, c of minus one one occupied with the supremum norm and by c of minus one one we mean this is the set of all continuous set of all continuous function on in closed interval minus one one and norm of an f here is nothing but uh, supremum uh, it is already given right so, yeah the norm is already given here this is the norm of a function and it, it makes this set this vector space into a norm space actually a complete norm space <coughs> with respect to this norm okay now the question is you define the linear functional t to be integral minus 1 to 0 f of t dt minus integral 0 to 1 f of t dt and the question is what is going to be the norm of t so it, it is asking compute this quantity supremum norm t uh, norm t of f divided by norm f f not equal to zero f in c of minus one one you need to we have to compute this quantity so how to compute how to compute the supremum there are ways to compute the supremum so what is the very common way to compute the supremum of something so one way is to do is you first find an upper bound for this so first you prove that this m is going to be an upper bound then you show that then there are two ways 
first once you get an upper bound then there are two ways and one is show there exist a uh, element for which the upper bound is attained upper bound is attained right that's one way and the second way is usual uh, uh, try to prove the uh, definition of supremum that you take something which is very less than the supremum then you show that there is an element in the set which is greater than that number that is the second method that is the show uh, proving the definition of uh, going with the definition of supremum so in this case we will go with this second case that we will try to uh, uh, solve using the definition of supreme and can anyone say what will be the uh, what what can be an upper bound for this quantity what can be a good upper upper bound for this quantity so this definition you can also rewrite as supremum some after some uh, uh, manipulation you can show that this is actually same as i mean not only in the case of c, c, c of minus 1 1 but this is same same in every normed space that is this quantity in general supremum x not equal to 0 x in x and norm tx by norm x this is same as supremum norm x equal to 1 uh, norm of tx these quantities are actually same that you can uh, simply prove by take putting some x by norm x is equal to some y or something you can prove this actually three is to the upper bound sorry two number two. Oh so, yeah good that is that was uh, really good so the upper bound is that two is a good upper bound yeah and uh, how did you get that <coughs> so because that uh, minus 1 to 0 integration is implies that 0 to uh, mm. 1 mm. Uh, with a negative sign yes yes then it will be uh, uh -huh. minus 2 into 0 to 1 f of t dt yes and the uh, if we get uh, the uh, uh, lowest thing in the domain is minus 1 uh -huh. so i consider the constant function f of x equal to minus 1 okay Okay, good. So, if you consider this function, we anyway we need f to be continuous. So you can't simply take this step function, uh, but it's it's, uh, it's also uh what uh, you can always approximate continuous function by step function you can always think of step function if you consider this function uh which is minus one uh, here and one here so what will what is going to be this integral so this is our function f of t so this will be one minus minus one so this will be two if f of t I defined in this way, I mean f is not continuous, but uh, if I take f of t to be minus 1 x greater than or equal to 0, 1 if x less than or equal to 0, then I am getting this integral to be 2. I think I am clear here. So, so you need f of t to be continuous, so or you can simply. Mm, yeah to get this upper bound you don't have to consider this function you can simply uh, calculate what is modulus of t of f you take this modulus inside uh, you will get this is modulus integral minus 1 to 0 f of t dt minus integral 0 to 1 f of t dt you take uh, apply triangle inequality you will get this is minus 1 to 0 f of t dt uh, plus integral 0 to 1 f of t dt modulus of course so this is 1 plus 1 
which is 2. So 2 is an upper bound. This you can get from triangle inequality. Okay. Now we are going to show that 2 is actually the least upper bound. <clears throat> and for that you have to consider this kind of functions. I am not going to detail proof but I will give you an idea how to prove this. You just have to put that into words. Uh, so you consider this graph and you take an epsilon. Uh, so how to show that this is actually the supremum so you take something which is less than 2 that is you take some 2 2 minus a I'll take epsilon by 4 or something uh, then uh, you have to show that there exists an f in c of minus 1, 1 such that norm of uh, f equal to 1 and norm of t of f is greater than 2 minus epsilon by 4. So in that case, supremum has to be 2, right? If this works for every epsilon, that's the definition of supremum. So you take something which is less than that upper bound and if you can show that there exists and f such that norm of tf is greater than 2 minus epsilon then your upper bound is going to be the least upper bound is going to be 2 this is what we are going to do so for that you take an epsilon and you consider this so this is uh, this this there is a bend here and there's a bend here also so this a, this length is say epsilon by 2 2 or something and this is also epsilon by 2 so in in between in the interval minus epsilon by 2 uh, plus epsilon by 2 you are joining this line that is uh, the line y equal to uh, 1 and y equal to minus 1 so in between this interval so you define f of t to be something um, uh, 1 x less than or equal to minus epsilon by 2 uh, minus 1 x greater than or equal to epsilon by 2 and the line joining so you can have always form an equation of line joining uh, this function so f of f of x i'll write line joining uh, this uh, what is uh, minus epsilon by 2 1 and uh, epsilon by 2 minus 1 if x is in the interval minus epsilon by 2 epsilon by 2 so this is the continuous function you have to take then from so you now just calculate this area this you will get so calculate this area and this area and you can simply show that uh, this whole area will be greater than 2 minus epsilon okay this is how we prove this and so for any epsilon we can have a continuous function such that uh, norm of t of f is greater than 2 minus epsilon and this is true for every epsilon that means uh, the least upper bound has to be 2 so here norm of t is actually is two now now there is similar question question number 13 it is also uh, about computing the norm of an operator t <coughs> mm. and can you can anyone say how what will be the answer question number 13 this is also same first you apply triangle inequality to obtain a uh, upper bound uh, then you show that that upper bound is the least upper bound so how to do that 
norm of t of f modulus of t of f is equal to modulus integral 0 to 1 to x f of x dx and this is less than or equal to integral 0 to 1 2 times mod x mod f of x dx and we are and which is less than or equal to so we are taking we want to know uh, this quantity that is supremum norm f equal to 1 mod t of f so we are always taking an norm of f to be 1 so here modulus of f of x is less than or equal to 1 this is 2 times mod x mod uh, times 1 I'm omitting that one tx so this will be uh, since the interval is 0 to 1 so this again I can write 2x dx so this will be 1 so 1 is an upper bound uh, now we want to show that 1 is the least upper bound and how to show that 1 is the least upper bound you can put f of x equal to 1 so here we are following another method so if you put f of x equal to 1 then what will be t of f integral 0 to 1 2 x dx which will be 1 so the supremum is actually attained at the constant function 1 so 1 is an upper bound and there exists a function which attains 1 so 1 is going to be the least upper bound so here the norm is 1 now this question kind of from uh, real analysis sir, sir. Uh, yes yes Sir, in above question, is there an extra condition in the question that the supremum is attained? Uh, where? Uh, in question, in uh, just uh, 13, question 13. Uh, there, there, there isn't any assumption that the supremum is attained. I mean, there, there, there are cases where the supremum is actually attained and there are cases where supremum is not attained. Uh, so in this case, the, the first example, we were not able to come up with a function where the supremum is actually attained we yes, sir. we need to approximate that supremum using that step function all right but in this case we can actually come up with a function which attains the supremum time and is there any extra condition in this question no 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 the it depends upon the operator t so if as operator changes this property also changes so for an for an operator this operator that property was in there if if you define the operator t in this way that that property that uh, the supremum attained at a point f was in there but when when, when you change to this operator here uh, question number 13 yeah when you change to this operator here then you can come up with a uh, function f which attains its supremum okay so it, it only depends upon the operator t uh, okay and it happens in every known space and there are even studies related to this and this kind of operators are called a norm attaining operators that its norm is being attained at uh, one particular point and this is also a uh, area of research in functional analysis that uh, to study the class of operator which attains its no at a particular point that's it also uh, it can be possible that it is yeah. attained its supremum in another norm i mean it is uh, just a specific norm no nah, yes 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 uh, yeah true true when norm changes also uh, if the operator yeah uh, changes its properties, especially this norm attaining property, it can change. Mm, now, the question number 14 is more of a linear algebra question. So I am skipping that. You can, uh, you don't need any tool from uh, norm space, uh, functional analysis to prove this. So I'm skipping this. Now, question number 15 is also kind of real analysis. Uh, how much time I have? Oh, so 
can we stop here and uh, go to uh, this please, discussion uh, session sorry sir uh, you can continue uh, uh, i think uh, 10 more minutes you can continue ah, sure, if you sure. have problem uh, sure sure yeah okay. i have to, some questions with me uh, now i'll discuss so far we were discussing questions from the gate examination now uh, i will go to uh, the csir net exam and i think questions here are bit simple simple easier than gate mm. okay mm. uh, question number 7 sir can you explain hilbert space uh, oh hilbert space overview uh, but it will take some time so that we may not get enough time to discuss this question uh, you you are in degree i guess right you completed your gap yes i am in uh, yes i am in primary uh, first year yeah oh, anyway you will learn about hilbert spaces next year so and uh, i don't think it will do any help you uh, help knowing it before i mean a quick recall on hilbert space won't be enough i mean that can uh, mislead mislead you also so <laughs> you learn in a proper way okay and if you need uh, if you want to know about hilbert spaces i can tell you but uh, we will talk about that later okay okay sir. so let's go to this question number 17 so you have this uh, uh space of all bounded sequences l infinity uh, that we have already defined and l2 that also we have already defined uh Uh, okay and you define a map t from l infinity to l2 as uh, this map we have also seen but in a different space you define t from uh, l infinity to l2 as a1 a2 by 2 a3 by 3 etc then which of the following statements are true that's the question so the first option is t is a continuous linear map i think you can easily answer that question because continuity means boundedness so will it be a continuous map can anyone answer that question yes it is bounded so continuous yeah so it's bounded and it is continuous so what about the second option t maps l infinity onto l2 what about this is it an onto map i think you don't need any uh, functional analysis here you only need a uh, real analysis to answer this question how to do this so you so you need if you have a sequence a n in l2 then the question is asking is an is of the form uh some uh bn by n where bn belongs to l infinity or in another way if you take the inverse map i mean does there exist a bn or or n times an belongs to n l infinity this is the question right it's because the image of n an will be a so if an belongs to l2 then n an belongs to l infinity this is the question so in other words if summation an square converges summation an square is finite does that says n an Uh, is bounded so 
show how to do that can you give me an example where this is not true that summation a n square converges and 1 by n n is 1 n. by n if if n is 1 by n then n n will be 1 right oh so it is bounded Mm. Here it is given that you can take this uh, AK from AN from complex field. So uh, one example that I got is this: if you take minus one by minus one power n by one by n, uh, one by n, one by root n, I guess. Does this sequence converges? Uh, in times, I mean, if you take log in, I think this sequence converges, right? This series converges, right? Yeah. Uh, and what about the square of this series? Does it converges? Mm, yes, sir. one by log n whole square. Yeah, I don't remember much from this. Uh, I hope you, you may you make because you are already seeing this very often. Uh, what about the square of this again? Is this finite? Sir. Sir. Ah uh, yes. We can uh, we can tell that uh, minus one to the power n by log n is convergent uh, by Leibniz test. Ah, uh, minus one to the power n one by log n is convergent. Now that's true. But what about this? If you if you take the square, sir, if we take a n is equal to one uh. by n square, uh huh. Uh, then n into a n will be one by n. Summation one by n is not convergent. No, no, no. Uh, we need the only a, a, a n times a n to be bounded. So log x less than x. So I can, we can write one by log x whole square is less than one by n square. And by comparison test, we can say. Uh, oh, oh, is that the case? Hmm. Or I can come up with something from n power p. I guess one by n power p converges. Or p greater than one, and if I take one by three by two, or I don't want three by two. I will take square uh, three by two. This converges, and this is n. And if it multiply it with n. One second, let me root the n times. Mm. One by Epsilon by two of a take and if a square this converges and if I multiply it with the n. Okay. Again, this is convergent, but I think there can be a counter example for this, but I am not getting what n is. Uh, Ah, yeah, this I can take. I guess if you take a n to be minus one power n one by root ten, 
uh, so you take this and so you take a root here also now it will find now it will work okay so you take root of minus 1 power n 1 by root n this you can take i guess no now there is no root here uh, everything comes inside root so in other way i can write n as mm, minus 1 raised to n by 2 uh, 1 by uh, root n this i can take right i take n to be this now if i consider summation a n square what you are getting is minus 1 times 1 by n right there is a summation and by Lebanese test you know that this is finite so summation a n square converges so this condition is satisfied now the question is n a n is n a n is bounded so if you think about that Is n a n bounded? So here a n is minus one power n by yeah, two. It is, is it bounded? This belongs to L two, right? So the question is whether t is on two. So for t to be on two, we need n a n belongs to L infinity. So does n a n belongs to L infinity? n a n will be minus 1 power n by 2 n by root n. So you cut a root n here, put a root n here. This is not bounded, right? It's not bounded. Am I correct? Yes. Mm. Or you can come up with yes, other sir. examples also. Uh, in some. Okay. Can you take 1 by n raised to 3 by 4 of n? Uh, oh, sorry, a n equal to so 1 by n raised to 3 by 4. Yes. Mm, and if you square it, uh, so you have 6, yeah, that's true. And if you put an n, uh, what will be this? But this will... n raised to? Yeah, this one is, by four. Ah, this so n raised to one by four. Yeah, that that example is also fine. Yeah, this is also fine. N equal to one by n raised to three. Yeah, that's it. It's very simple. Don't make this very complicated. I didn't get that example first, so I took this. So what about T inverse? Does T inverse exist and continuous? So you can say that T inverse T inverse actually doesn't exist, right? Because you have already seen that for a n equal to this, the inverse image will be not there in L infinity. So T inverse does not exist. So, and what about option D? T is uniformly continuous. I mean, those who have did the course in functional analysis can easily answer this question. Will T be uniformly continuous? So, if you are working in norm space and if you have a linear operator T, T linear, then T is continuous. If and only if T is uniformly continuous. So, the option 4 is also correct. So, this is a theorem. About continuity. So for a linear operator on a norm space X, T is continuous if and only if T is uniformly continuous. Okay, I'll do one more problem and we will stop. So you look at uh, the real vector space V of polynomials of degree less than or equal to D. And you define uh, a function norm pk to be maximum of uh, modulus of p of 0, 
P1 of 0, Pk of 0, where this Pi of 0 denote the, uh, we are taking the ith derivative and evaluated at the 0. Then the question is when this Pk is going to be a norm on V. Okay, so uh, you think about it, the first condition is trivially satisfied that this norm x is greater than or equal to 0, because here we are taking modulus everywhere. And the triangle inequality is also satisfied. That also you can check. Uh, now the problem is that this question, that uh, positivity, that uh, norm, we have this condition that norm x equal to 0 if and only if x is equal to 0. Right. That is what we are going to check here. So uh, how to check that? So we are defining norm of pk to be maximum of these quantities. And what is the relation between this k and the degree of the polynomial d pk of 0 uh, equal to 0 implies so if you have no assume that norm x is equal to norm pk equal to 0 we need pk the vector pk the function the polynomial pk to be zero right so by definition norm of pk is maximum of mod p of zero etc pk of zero this is zero uh, that implies each of these quantity is zero mod p of zero is zero etc pk of zero is zero Right, everything is zero because all are positive and maximum is zero. So this is zero. But when this says that P is zero, when this says, right, what is P of zero equal to zero in place? That is the constant time A naught of the polynomial is zero. What is P dash of P dash of 0 equal to 0 in place. That is a, a, a 1 equal to 0 or A 2 equal to 0. A, a 1 equal to 0, right? Yes. What is P K of 0 equal to 0 in place? The kth coefficient of pk is zero right and we know that the degree of p equal to d but if we have this much assumptions on p will when this says that p is itself zero what what should be the relation between d and k D less than equal to K. D less than or equal to K. Yeah. Or D less than or equal to K. Right. Because if K is less than D, you can have a polynomial, say X power D, X power D minus 1, etc. X power K, etc. Uh, some constant C. And this condition says is that up to here the uh, coefficients are all zero but you don't know about the coefficients here right if k is less than d so if pk of zero is zero for all k equal to say pi of zero equal to zero for all uh, i equal to one two three etc k does not says that does not says p the a k plus one that is the coefficient of x k plus one uh, does not says a k plus one is equal to zero so we cannot conclude so we cannot conclude p k is zero if K is strictly less than D. So the condition should be uh, K is greater than or equal to D.
Thank you, Vishwas. Uh, I am a MSc first year student uh, for Main IT TP. Uh, sir, today's session was really good, and uh, and the topic you teach us uh, that that clear uh, so many doubts. And uh, thank you so much, sir, for the great session. Sir, uh, I have a uh, I yes. want a suggestion. Yes, you can. Mm. Uh, sir, uh, in our present semester we have topology. Uh, but I am confused uh, that oh. what book to follow and uh, which book will be the uh, best for beginners. Uh, I think um, uh, textbook by Mangus, James Mangus, will be a good. Uh, I'd say it's a good book uh, for beginners. Also, if you read, uh, if you put some time, then that book is really good. And if you uh, really want to know about this uh, point set topology theory, then. Uh, with many examples and all, you can uh, look at this KD Joshi general topology. Uh, that also uh, explains, uh, I mean, they gave very much examples and explained in well detail. Uh, and Munger's text, text is also uh, good. I'll write the name in the chat box. Yeah, Srijit, let me add something. Uh, see, Titi, uh, K.D. Joshi's book is uh, really a motivating book for topology. In Mangas, you may not see that type of motivation. See, directly go to topology and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but topology, uh, K.D. Joshi's general topology, introduction to general topology will give you uh, a real motivation uh, how the topology comes and all that. So that will be more good. And of course, uh, Mangas is the most standard one. And there is a book by Simmons, Topology and Modern Analysis. That is also and, a very nice book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not just topology, but uh, yeah. functional analysis yeah. and even yeah. many more things are there. Yeah. Uh, and, and also keep in mind that, yeah, in, keep in mind that in order to learn functional analysis, you need a, a good background of linear algebra, topology, and all analysis. Everything is very much needed. Uh, yes. Actually, functional analysis is a blend of all this. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Titi. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Others? Feel free to interact, dear students. <laughs> is there any... Any other one wish to say something? Somebody has already messaged in the chat box. Who is it? Uh, is functional analysis a part of IIT jam TAFR also? Uh, no, for TAFR, I don't think functional analysis is there. Uh, IIT jam, uh, it, it may not yeah, be there, jam, right? Yeah, it is not there. Only uh, vector space portions are, were there. Mm -hmm. okay. For gate exam, they will ask. Yeah. Gate and uh, yes. ah, CCR, JRF and all that. And if you're preparing for some PhD interviews and if you really want to work in functional analysis, uh, then also you can uh, look at the basics of functional analysis. Yes. Okay, I think uh, many of them are disconnected due to the range issues and all that, I think. Okay. <laughs> Actually, okay. uh, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, Srijit. Yeah, yes, Dharmendra. Please. Uh, most, sir. I have to liquidate functional analysis. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear him. I couldn't hear him. Tarmendra, can you repeat? What are the prerequisites? What are prerequisites? Yeah. Yeah, in order to learn functional analysis, what are the prerequisites? Okay, okay. Okay, you need linear algebra, you need a uh, good amount of real analysis uh, and topology, of course. That's the prerequisite. Uh, basics of everything will be needed. That's it. Linear algebra, you should know very well. And topology, you need the basics of topology. Uh, and if you, if you know the metric topology, it, it, uh, but uh, it will also help you. So that's it. That's all what you need to do a course in functional analysis. Yes. Yeah, sound knowledge in linear algebra is very much essential because you know the basic object of study is linear spaces along with some structures that uh, helps us to 
uh, do some analysis like no more inner product yeah. yes sir. so <laughs> yes thank you darmendra so some yeah we will uh, so srijit i request you to share the pdf of today's class if possible yeah but share. i i have written it and i made it very <laughs> bad so I yeah, that is not a problem <laughs> that is not a problem people those, those who want they can uh, yeah they can get uh, some hints from that and uh, uh, they can prepare themselves a more uh, okay clear. okay yeah, i'll try to make it bit clean then i'll send to you <laughs> okay and also if some of the problems were not uh, worked out in the session if it possible uh, you can add the solutions to the analysis ah uh, sure sure i'll do that Uh, give me some time i'll, I'll upload soon yeah so uh, we will upload the recorded video also so if you can uh -huh. do it uh, one or two, within one or two days we can share with that okay uh -huh. so that yeah, means uh, is asking some, is there any yeah, video we, yeah we will in, yeah we, we will share we will share the video recording in youtube and uh, the link to that will be shared through our groups no he is asking is there any video lecture by any premier institute I mean, uh, I think he is asking whether there is any courses in functional analysis offered by Premier Institute. Yeah, it may be there in NPTEL or uh, in YouTube yeah. itself. Sometimes it will uh, be there. Yeah. NPTEL, there will be these courses. I guess uh, basic functional analysis courses will be there. I think uh, S H Kulkarni has done some courses. I have seen somewhere. I think mm -hmm. uh, yeah. of Mad Madras I A T. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, if I get the link, then I will share that too. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So I think let us wind up here. Thank you, Srijit, for joining with us. Ah, it's uh, my pleasure. For, yeah, for being with being with Math Experience groups. Ah. So <laughs> let us hope that, uh, dear participants, let us hope that uh, today's session was uh, really uh, you have enjoyed today's session. Uh, Okay, somebody is asking about group theory. Group theory, we have already done some sessions on group theory. If possible, we will arrange in future also. So thanks, uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, let us wind up here. Thank you, thank you, Srinivas. Oh, okay, you. thank you. Yes, bye.